Good morning. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. We've got people in the back still coming in. I'd remind you to, to come early, and you'll have the best pick of the donuts up there. I take no responsibility for the fact that we continue to, to feed hard, unhealthy donuts, but we do want to want to please the crowd and uh, hope you uh, enjoy not just the food, but what is an outstanding lineup for uh, Grand Rounds this year. Our chief resident, Scott Saunders, has worked with me really to, to identify speakers from within and without to uh, provide Grand Rounds for us. Today, I'm especially excited to be kicking off Grand Rounds by introducing uh, Dr. Dodd Siraj, a new faculty member as of 2016. Um, Dr. Siraj graduated from Jima Institute of Health Sciences for his MD degree in Ethiopia. He worked as a physician in Ethiopia prior to attending residency in the United States at St. Barnabas Hospital in the Bronx, followed by uh, Infectious Disease Fellowship at Tulane, where he also uh, took a Master of Public Health and Tropical Medicine degree. He joined the Brody School of Medicine uh, at East Carolina University as an assistant professor in 2002 and arose through the ranks uh, by the time we stole him away where he was professor um, and of uh, medicine, adjunct associate professor in the School of Public Health and program director for the Infectious Disease Fellowship. He is currently a professor of medicine, associate program director for the Infectious Disease Fellowship program um, and the director of the International Travel Clinic here at the University of Wisconsin. He's published broadly um, from uh, in a number of different topics, among them uh, generally infectious disease such as opportunistic infections and HIV AIDS, an early paper as well as uh, threat of malaria for U.S. travelers, and most recently barriers and facilitators of infection control at a hospital in northern India along this ID global health theme. He's received grant funding including for uh, for novel treatments for HIV and AIDS, and most recently as a faculty development grant to start the groundwork for this global health pathway you'll be hearing about. He's been an avid teacher in the classroom and beyond and has been honored for his excellence. Among other honors, he received the Best Exemplary Alumni Award from Jima University. He's been recognized as a top doctor by US News and World Report, and he received a certificate he received a certificate of recognition from His Excellency, the President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, something none of us can claim to have received. Um, he's been very active as a good citizen in academic medicine and a good world citizen. He's a member of the HIV Medical Association, the Ethiopian Medical Association. He's president of the Ethiopian Infectious. He's been president of the Ethiopian Infectious Disease Network. Uh, he's been involved in the International Society of Travel Medicine and their GeoSentinel network, and uh, he's worked with the program directors for infectious disease and the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, he's a certified member of the EpiCorps Surveillance Network, which is a worldwide network of medical professionals who communicate epidemics and outbreaks throughout the world to better detect outbreaks of disease and he served as an associate editor for Horn of Africa Journal of AIDS. Aside from being a good citizen academically, um, he's, he's giving back to his home in serving as the president and creator of the Jima University Alumni International Branch, and he is a board member and vice chair of the Ethio American Doctors Group uh, who are working together to build a high and tertiary hospital in Addis Ababa, uh, Ethiopia. He's given a number of CME presentations. Uh, I counted 16 national and international, and actually has given nine grand rounds in the past. So he's one of our more experienced grand round speakers. But as we were discussing, this is a special one in that he's going to be talking about some aspirations he has here at the University of Wisconsin. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Siraj as he presents Grand Rounds entitled Global Health Pathways, Bridging the Gap in Residency Education. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much, Dr. Page, for those uh, kind words. This is my first uh, Grand Round here, so I'll, I'll take it as the first one. Uh, 
Uh, but also thank you for uh, allowing me to come in here and give this uh, grand round. As many of you know, uh, I have been be uh, working to build this global health pathway for our department. And this talk really is just to introduce this program and to show you what kind of promises it carry for us as, uh, as a department, both for uh, the trainees and also for the faculty. And with that, I want to start uh, my presentation. I have no financial uh, conflict. So the objectives of this talk are going to be to outline the benefits of Global Health Pathway to the department, uh, to describe the mission and objectives of this Global Health Pathway, and also to identify opportunities for faculty uh, to take part in this Global Health uh, Initiative and uh, program. Just if we look back and see uh, where we are right now, Medicine is really advancing at a remarkable pace. Uh, we have just deciphered human genome. Uh, we are at the era of precision and uh, personalized uh, medicine. Uh, we are developing genetic testers uh, that would identify and really remarkably at a precise degree uh, tell us who would benefit from interventions and who would have side effects from uh, specific interventions. Really, this is a, a remarkable age to live in. But unfortunately, while this is going on, and we should continue to do the pace as we owe it to our patients, unfortunately, for the majority of the world population, for those who are living in the developing countries, in a low-income country, this is not where their problem is. Their problem is uh, the, the major diseases that will afflict them, the ones that would cause uh, the majority of morbidity and mortality for those, are fairly well known and their interventions a long time settled. The problem is in translating the already existing knowledge. These are malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and vaccine preventable diseases. And if we just stop for a moment and think about malaria, every single year 247 million people are infected from malaria. And out of those, 700,000 under five children die just in sub-Saharan Africa alone. I mean, it's a staggering number. And yet the treatment is clear, the prevention is known, uh, and uh, the interventions are all uh, figured out. But the intervention and the translational medicine is uh, where we are uh, lacking. This is a world map. And if you see this map, every single country is represented here based on its proportional land mass. If we were to think a little bit different corner, in a different corner, and try to envision this world from the perspective of disease burden, uh, who, is going to who is carrying uh, the disease burden, the picture will look like this. Sub-Saharan Africa actually carries the heaviest burden of disease, uh, just followed by uh, Asia. While North America, uh, western part of Europe, uh, Japan, and uh, Australia uh, do not almost seem to exist in this map. If we flip the question a little bit and try to see the world based on wealth, manpower in terms of health distribution, uh, and also infrastructure distribution, the picture cannot be more different than the one that we saw before. Uh, Africa wouldn't have existed if it was not for South Africa, as you can see here. Uh, and as you can see, the bloated ones are North America, uh, western part of Europe and uh, Japan. When you see this kind of discrepancy in terms of the burden weight that countries carry and the number of distribution of manpower and infrastructure, it is not surprising really to add one and one and see why translating those fairly well-known factors is uh, very difficult. Liberia is somewhere here in western Africa, uh, a country that was uh, basically created by U.S. for uh, uh, freed slaves to go back to uh, Africa a long time back. It has about 5 million population. The physician to population ratio per thousand population is 0 0.01, a 250% lower than what it is in uh, U.S. So when we talk about global health, really what global health means is just to understand the root causes of this kind of dist uh, disabilities and uh, disparities, uh, the root cause of uh, these uh, differences, 
introduce the health disparities that we see both at home here uh, within our communities uh, and abroad. It is a collaborative and highly interdisciplinary uh, uh, institution and uh, project. Uh, it requires the involvement of uh, a number of institutions far beyond the uh, classic uh, health institutions. So when we are challenging our learners uh, to think about this difference on how to close this gap, on researching about this difference, and on diseases that are disproportionately burdening uh, those low-income uh, uh, countries, uh, we are one step ahead in global health work, actually. So I am originally from uh, Ethiopia. Uh, it is in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, as you can see, it, uh, we traditionally call it the Horn of Africa, a very uh, unstable area, uh, at least to say. Uh, I did my medical school in Ethiopia, but most of my training afterwards have been uh, in this country. Throughout my training and after my graduation, I have maintained actually a very close contact with uh, Ethiopian medical community as well as a number of the universities there. And this has allowed me actually to open an international rotation for residents, uh, medical students, uh, and fellows alike. And uh, thankfully for over a decade, actually, I have been doing this on a yearly basis. And this is one of the uh, uh, travels that we had to Ethiopia with my medical students. Uh, some of you might uh, figure out uh, the Wisconsin uh, faculties at the back of this uh, picture. One thing that always uh, do when we travel, and I'm sure many of you who travel internationally will attest to this, is we kind of try to figure out the objectives of the travel. What are we planning to do? And we sit down, we create this um, uh, list of things that we want to accomplish, uh, always center around uh, looking, seeing more of tropical diseases, HIV, AIDS, uh, probably uh, perfecting our uh, clinical skill for medical students especially, and maybe even doing a little bit of procedures. And on up, upon our return, uh, thankfully we do that and we accomplish this. But what amazes me most uh, in our debriefing after we return back is the much deeper transformation that I see in trainees uh, as a human being uh, after their return from such kind of uh, a trip. Medical practice in developing country, in low resource country, is a very stressful and challenging business. Uh, this is uh, one of the Ethiopian medical uh, facilities that I visited recently. Uh, a broken leg is uh, applied, tra traction is applied in a broken leg uh, with bricks and stones and a plastic bag. Um, these are the kind of things that you see. Uh, that the other one is a, an, an emergency room, as you can see, a dark emergency room uh, in one of the other hospitals with uh, empty oxygen tanks uh, at the doorstep. For many of our students who travel internationally to developing country, this is their first time. As such, uh, the experience opens their eyes to the disparities that exist uh, and the just uh, suboptimal and standardized uh, medical care that uh, we deliver. It humbles them uh, beyond what they have expected to get uh, when they travel. I always hope that this transformation uh, is uh, a long-lasting, even if they don't decide to continue in, uh, global health. So when I say why global health for us, what I say is, besides the altruistic and universal goals that I have mentioned right now here, it really allows us to create a humble and better informed physicians. It allows us to produce uh, uh, those better informed and deep, who have a deep understanding uh, in the healthcare inequity uh, and who are willing uh, to try to solve uh, these problems. At the university, uh, this by itself uh, should be a goal that every one of us uh, should aspire to have, uh, to transform our students uh, to a, a very more methodical and uh, uh, deep thinkers uh, on how to solve this disparity, uh, both ag across the world and within our communities here. But there are more reasons, equal reasons, uh, that why we should have global health. If you look at the U.S. population, it is rapidly transforming. About 13% of the U.S. population right currently uh, are born abroad. If you were to add their children, this will account to about 20% of the total population. 
And 25% of the annual growth of U.S. population actually is directly tied to the new immigrants uh, that are flowing. Uh, in the era of uh, President Trump, that might change, but I don't think it will be a very easy one to change this trend. And in addition to that, about 60 million U.S. population actually travels abroad uh, annually, most of them to developing countries. So when you look at the medical issues that this segment of a population brings to the physicians, wherever they are, uh, it really requires a different set of skills. Uh, these are going to bring diseases that are proportional and endemic to their own country. And producing physicians who are well aware about the demography of those diseases and the prevalence of those diseases and how to intervene uh, when they happen uh, is right by itself uh, a very good goal uh, to aim for. Every year, uh, or oftentimes, the U.S. government, together with the intelligence and scientific community, uh, run a global security threat analysis in this country, both uh, in U.S. and globally. And every time this exercise is done, there are a couple of uh, issues that really stand out uh, at the first ones. And one of the things that uh, interests us is Pandemics always is at the forefront. Uh, pandemics that arises in one corner of the globe uh, where the surveillance and disease detection systems are very weak or broken uh, in a low and maybe middle income country to gradually overwhelm uh, the globe in general. And when you see the list of recent diseases that have visited us, uh, those who are here, uh, it is not surprising. Even for the medical community, those diseases, before they cause the epidemic or pandemic that they have caused, were not even very well known, except for the researchers who are practicing on those particular fields. SARS alone has costed about 30 billion in just four months to the whole total world population. At the bottom it says, a rapid and effective response could have avoided most of this. How true that is. So, a number of uh, uh, institutions have already recognized that supporting those low income countries to improve their manpower capacity to do prevalence uh, surveillance, to do early disease detection and diagnosis, is not only a generous and morally or ethically correct way to go by, but it's also uh, uh, a very good, sound, and smart public as well as economic policy. So uh, as one of uh, our congressmen has said, it, it's much cheaper to control an outbreak abroad uh, than a pandemic at our uh, sh shore. So because of this, uh, and, uh, the world is now recognizing that investing in infrastructure, in global health, and uh, training of those low-income countries actually is uh, a smart economic policy. In fact, that is what the report of Global Health 235 has concluded. This Global Health 235 report that was uh, uh, compiled by the Lancet Commission, an independent commission, but with a very eminent world-known economists and global health experts, uh, one of their conclusion is the international community should double the current research and development spending from three billion to six billion just in two to three years, as you can see it here. So this is going to happen because a lot of countries and a lot of organizations are recognizing this. But for us at the university, uh, improving the global health knowledge of our residents, our trainees in general, and creating an opportunity and access for our faculty to tap into this kind of uh, 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 programs is a must, and we have to start it uh, here. Recently, uh, the World Health Organization have a new uh, uh, director general, and uh, the global health community is really excited about him. Uh, because of his uh, track record in uh, promoting and championing global health. And this is what he said just after it's him, his election. The new WHO head seeks U.S. bipartisan support uh, 
for global health. Um, interestingly, Dr. Tedros uh, was the Minister of Health of Ethiopia before he was elected as the WHO Director General. And this is in one of the, the international meetings that was, I attended. Uh, I was uh, uh, invited to an HIV meeting, and he's next to me. So this person uh, is a champion in global health, and he's going to do everything in his power to convince organizations and countries to invest in global health, and we got to start to be ready uh, to tap into this uh, uh, wealth and uh, really uh, expertise. The good thing is medical students, residents, and fellows training in general are ahead of us. If you look at the SEGME annual report, uh, in every direction the survey is done, uh, the interest in global health, the interest uh, to acquire cultural competency and ethical competency of residents and fellows is increasing. And actually, a lot of medical institutions are recognizing this and introducing global health in some way or form uh, into their curriculum. If you look at uh, residency programs, these are a few surveys that I just want to mention. One of them is from surgical residents. In that survey, 98% were interested uh, in global health, and actually 73% of them actually would have elected global health uh, uh, elective uh, more than any other elective in their uh, uh, training. Uh, much closer to our home, there was a survey done in Milwaukee and Madison uh, among the primary care uh, residents. And what they found is 58% of those actually who were surveyed are interested in global health, but unfortunately only 9% of them actually considered the residency program to be adequately equipped enough to train them uh, in global health. As, as we all know, uh, medical, res medical schools and residency programs are trying, scrambling really, to introduce global health into their training program. They will integrate global health topics into the core curriculum or offer courses in global or public health, uh, uh, tropical medicine. But as good as they are, these are uh, a very uh, uh, small interventions that would not satisfy the interest uh, and the aspirations of a number of trainees uh, to be a global health champions and advocates. We are actually lucky uh, here at the University of Wisconsin because we have a very organized and reputable global health institution. In those institutions, wherever they are, uh, they are actually providing a formal global health training here. We have masters in public and population health and also certificate in global health. These are all well and good, but I know many of you know that a, a number of residents and fellows are not taking this opportunity. And the reason is very clear. Uh, there is a time commitment that is required for this. When you are signing for master in public or population health, it's another year or a year and a half addition, in addition to your residency program or fellowship program, and not to mention even the financial burden that comes with it. So unless the hardcore, really determined residents and fellows who want to go in global health as their career, uh, very few residents and fellows actually took this. Uh, so we see clearly that there is a big uh, unmet need, uh, an opening, an opportunity for us to intervene and uh, introduce global health pathways or global health tracks here. Global health pathways and tracks are kind of a blend between those two, just giving them just simple core curriculum talks versus uh, the uh, well-structured certificates or uh, degrees. It's not going to have a significant time requirement because they're going to finish their residency in the timeline, uh, but it will give a, a breadth uh, and depth of knowledge in global health and also international uh, experience. So there are a number of universities who have tried this one. Uh, just uh, to cite a few, uh, Duke University have a very good global health program within their Department of Internal Medicine. And in a survey that they have done, 42% cited actually the presence of global health to be a reason for them to select Duke University as their residency destination. In another uh, data, of course, uh, as any good program goes, uh, Duke University now have extended their uh, global health program to almost a one-year program in addition to their residency program as the demand is growing uh, day by day, really. At Yale University, what they have found is uh, internal medicine residents who have done global health uh, experience, 
are more likely to choose a career uh, uh, in uh, general medicine than uh, specialties. A welcome change uh, when we see uh, the shortage of uh, primary care physicians uh, in this country. Another paper that was published at Journals of Graduate Medical Education has seen that uh, residents who have been trained in global health practice more in rural area, stay in public health, and be leaders uh, in crucial organizations with agenda in uh, uh, global health. Here in our graduate medical education, uh, we have seen uh, a big interest, and we're grateful actually to the Graduate Medical Education Committee because seeing that interest, they have increased uh, the uh, 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 funding for our uh, global health uh, program starting 2010, uh, 2011. So anyone who is interested to go internationally would be uh, funded for that uh, particular uh, time. And this ha the trend, as you can see it, has been increasing uh, year by year. Uh, for the first time, 2016, all slots have been taken by uh, residents from our uh, programs. This is all well and good, but the problem is very few programs actually have organized a very uh, well methodically thought out program of global health around those international uh, rotations. Uh, pediatrics, uh, uh, emergency medicine, uh, family medicine, and GYN are one of some of the departments in this uh, institution who have benefited from this. So it is with this understanding that I'm trying to create the global health pathway within our department of medicine. This is going to be a comprehensive three-year longitudinal program that will introduce our residents and fellows to global health concepts that I have mentioned already. Uh, they're going to be working on disproportionately affected uh, uh, society segments, both within the country and uh, globally. And we're going to explore the cultural and ethical issues of delivering health uh, in such uh, uh, communities. We're going to also mentor them to do research on global health agendas. And uh, uh, at last, we're going to allow them to go to international sites for hands-on experience uh, in international and global health uh, practice. So the overarching mission of our program is going to be education and research. But to succeed in both education and research, we're going to have a, a very well-organized and collaborative networking system, both in, within our institution and internationally. And we are working uh, to do that. This will support the interdisciplinary education that global health deserves, and also it will foster research collaboration among institutions both uh, within and outside. The education curriculum is going to be sought out and worked up very well to include all those things that we mentioned, uh, whether it's the tropical diseases or the ethical and cultural issues, and uh, delivering medical care in low-income settings. We're going to use uh, different modalities of teaching, whether it's lecture, journal club, uh, book reading, invited speakers, and group discussions to uh, promote those uh, ideas. We will have some interdepartmental sessions where our residents are going to actually have the opportunity to meet other global health uh, uh, trainees within uh, our institution in other departments. Uh, one of the interesting thing is we're going to be building simulation cases for tropical diseases and also on how to implement uh, 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 medical practice in resource limited settings. We have a lot of uh, built-in experience in our uh, institution uh, on simulating cases in the Department of Pediatrics who are leaders nationally and also internationally on this one. We are going to capitalize with, from this experience and build our own set of cases, uh, even for those uh, who are not going to be in our pathway who wants to do uh, uh, a couple of uh, simulation cases. Of course, there will be a one week long, funda long fundamentals global health course. This is a course that is already going on in our institution again, led by pediatrics and global health uh, task force. So our residents probably are going to be attending this uh, uh, course, which is an Im really a deep immersion uh, course that will introduce them to all the uh, uh, important facets of global health that we just talked about. And of course, uh, they will be going for a month uh, elective internationally uh, to a designated site. Uh, at the beginning, we're going to start with Ethiopia, but eventually, uh, I'm sure we're going to grow uh, to other uh, sites also. 
So the research component is a very interesting part of this global health uh, uh, mission. Uh, we will be mentoring trainees uh, to do uh, of global health consequence researches. I mean, any research that any of our faculty is doing right now, currently, can be tweaked to be a global health interest. And with the interest that we have seen and the research funding that is coming from a lot of places, really, uh, we should start thinking on how to capitalize on the researches that we are doing. Uh, residents will be mentored, but at the same time, we will be uh, gradually migrating to a global health research. Just in this one year that I have been here, uh, we have started an infection control research with Jima University. Uh, we got a Shapiro project student uh, who have just returned back from Ethiopia collecting data. Uh, we are already working on an HIV uh, research uh, with uh, one of the Addis Ababa University. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities, whether it is from uh, uh, non-infectious disease uh, programs, cancer, rheumatology, uh, and all those. Just in my recent trip, uh, a, a team of cardiologists just approached me uh, to help them doing a rheum rheumatic heart disease research. It's in Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia has a prevalence of rheumatic heart disease, one of the highest in the world. And the intervention, as many of you know, is uh, just a shot of penicillin when they have tonsillitis. And they wanted to do uh, research on this, and uh, this can be a great uh, area for any aspiring cardiologist uh, to work on, uh, on during his residency uh, period. So to do this all, we have to build a, a very strong capacity, uh, both locally and internationally. Uh, locally, we will need mentors. Uh, so uh, the presentation of this is actually to solicit uh, all the support that I can get from our department to mentor our residents and fellows uh, in this regard. Uh, not only uh, uh, mentoring them on their ideas, but providing them with ideas on where they can focus uh, based on the interest that uh, you see in the field. But it also, within our uh, institution and internationally, uh, there are a lot of global health champions uh, working uh, on uh, the same topics that we are working and we will be working uh, together. On the sites that we are going to be building, where our residents and fellows are going to go for international rotation, we really need to empower them uh, by building the manpower capacity uh, so that they will be our mentors and uh, teachers for our residents, but also the infrastructure should be kept up uh, so that uh, we can do actually a high-end uh, fundable uh, researches in those sites also. So recently in February, I traveled to Ethiopia to visit a couple of universities who showed interest uh, to work with us. Uh, I saw uh, three universities, uh, Addis Ababa in the capital, Addis Ababa University, uh, Jima uh, and Awasa, so, uh, universities. And this is Addis Ababa University, Black Lion Hospital, over a 700-bed uh, hospital, a tertiary facility, uh, uh, a number of uh, departments from our institution actually have a collaboration agreement already with Addis Ababa University. Uh, this is Jima University. This is a new uh, built uh, hospital facility that they have, a 700-plus bed number. And as you can see here, uh, eight beds in a single room is not an uncommon finding, uh, even in this new uh, hospital that they just uh, built. And this is Awasa University, a 450-plus uh, uh, bed uh, university. Uh, all of them have shown uh, a great deal of interest, but I think we're going to start with Jima, uh, uh, with Jima University, and build on uh, from our experience. Juma University is one of the uh, much more rigorous <coughs> and well-respected research institutions within Ethiopia. Uh, just last year, they have, on average, on a yearly basis, they have about 80 articles on a peer-reviewed journal. And they host the Ethiopian Journal of Health Sciences. Does, it doesn't include us. <laughs> uh, it hosts the Ethiopian Journal of Health Sciences. Uh, and also recently it has been uh, selected actually to be the demographic health survey site, uh, which is basically to collect uh, longitudinal data like the Framingham uh, data over time. This will be a very good opportunity for us uh, to do longitudinal studies also. So 
at the end, after all this uh, trying to convince uh, the, uh, some the convinced already and some the not convinced, I want to say again a couple of reasons why we uh, need the global health uh, program in our department. It really helps a lot of programs, uh, and it will probably be true for us also in the future, to recruit the best fellows and residents. Uh, residents and fellows ask about global health exposure uh, uh, oftentimes when they do interview. This gives a great deal of satisfaction for those who are interested in global health, both fellows, residents, and also faculty who will give them an opportunity and a different avenue in their uh, uh, career. It will be a site for research on international and global health projects uh, for us. Uh, this will be a site where we could be collaborating with a number of scientists, international scientists. Um, I mean, uh, a number of scientists uh, who have been now fairly very well known in their respective field uh, started their career just by a simple introduction internationally. It's the same. Uh, the same is true uh, about the research that's going on in this university on Zika virus. A simple introduction and knowing a site in Brazil is what started all this uh, high-end uh, research. It will also allow us to train health professionals who want to address uh, health disparity, both here uh, locally uh, and also internationally. Uh, Bennett is not here today, but uh, he always would ask me, how are you going to measure their progress? How are you going to measure whether they are growing in this field or not? And I have thought about that, and we're going to include all those six main core competency uh, that SEGME looks for in a residency program or any other uh, uh, interventions that we do in our trainees, and we will have uh, uh, an evaluation uh, based on those six uh, core competencies. I hope I have convinced you uh, enough uh, to say that we should be involved and also uh, to call me to tell me how you could be involved personally. Uh, but if you're not, uh, when we go to Ethiopia for an international rotation, I promise I'll take you to the Ethiopian National Museum uh, where uh, the oldest human ancestor, Lucy, is housed, a 3.5 million years old uh, skeleton remaining. Uh, in his last trip to uh, internationally, Obama actually went to Ethiopia, uh, and this is when he was examining uh, the remaining of Lucy. <laughs> As a side, Obama asked the curator, so is this the origin of every human being in this globe? And uh, the curator answered, yes, Everyone, including Donald Trump. <laughs> and one of the news media, actually, outlet in the U.S., uh, put it in their first page. <laughs> uh, if that is not enough, uh, I don't know a lot of people who would resist the temptation of uh, traditional Ethiopian food. Uh, we will include it into our curriculum of international rotation. And uh, that will tempt you, actually, if uh, you are not. But finally, in summary, uh, global health trained residents and fellows tend to serve the poor, the marginalized population, and the ones who have less access. With growing interest in global health among trainees, there is an unmet need in global health uh, within our department. And uh, thank you to Dr. Page and also David Andes. Uh, uh, they have been champions in helping me to organize this uh, program so we have in this department and division uh, a commitment uh, to support this training. Uh, really, I need uh, your support uh, all, from every uh, department uh, division that we have within our department. And finally, I want to thank a couple of uh, individuals. Uh, Nasia has been a role model, uh, an advisor, a mentor, really somebody to look up to when I was working uh, in Global Health uh, since I uh, arrived here. And of course, David Andes, uh, Dr. Page, uh, Bennett uh, have understood the importance of this for our residency program, fellowship program, and also our faculty, and allowing me to have the time to work on this one. And I hope over the time in the future, I will uh, produce something of concrete uh, uh, result on this uh, area. And John Addington White has been a champion from the first day that I mentioned uh, global health uh, to her and I really want to thank her. 
Uh, we are uh, really uh, honored to and uh, have, uh, fortunate to have uh, a very organized global health task force uh, in this institution. Uh, we have a task force from all departments that is organized and really designs and works in synchrony uh, to promote uh, global health in every department. I particularly want to thank uh, Sabrina, who is at the back, uh, who guides the uh, Department of uh, Pediatrics Global Health Program, uh, a very well-known person nationally and internationally in this field. Uh, Jim from Global Health, I don't know if he's here today. Uh, Gurma Tafara from Department of Surgery and Janice uh, from Department of Emergency Medicine. There are a number to mention, but these were the ones that were uh, directly helping me in uh, building our global health. And with that, uh, I will finish my talk. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to entertain. Thank you very much, Dr. Siraj. And, and, you know, I think back just less than two years ago when Dave Andes invited you here and, and you've uh, first to interview and then to, to join us and you've already had a, a significant impact. Uh, let me ask you to call on the audience and please repeat the questions or comments uh, for the recording. So it's open for discussion? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I, I didn't go into that in detail. Uh, oh, so the question is basically, was there any particular uh, thing in that program, in the YEL program, that has actually driven residents uh, uh, to go to primary care? Is that, is that the concept? So basically, I didn't go into the details, but one of the things that we are planning to do in our uh, global health is we're going to actually figure out where the uh, free clinics, uh, refugee clinics are within our uh, uh, community. And actually those global health uh, uh, pathway residents and fellows are going to be involved in those activities. And my feeling is when they are being challenged continuously with this kind of uh, activities and looking uh, uh, directly into the discrepancies and the disparities that they see, in the services that are provided within our community. I'm hoping that uh, someday, somehow, somewhere, for somebody, it will click and uh, uh, they wanted to change their uh, practice uh, in the long term. Uh, I didn't see any particular thing that they have added, but they have a lot of general medicine and HIV uh, and infectious diseases rotations added into their uh, 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 into their uh, electives for those residents. Go ahead, please. This is a great question. The question is basically, when you are going to international sites and build a program, first of all, how do you maintain the interest from the other side? Because what, what is in it for them? But the other thing is, how do you integrate the learning process of your learners with the learning process of their learners? Uh, is that what is it? So this is a very important concept uh, issue that is really a burning issue for any program who wants to have a sustainable program in global health. We have to be very creative on how we want to support those programs while they are supporting us 
in exposing our residents and fellows to a global health issue. And the way how we do it, and, and I actually had a discussion with many of those hospitals and universities uh, when we do this, how, what do you need from us? How do we empower you uh, so that this is not a one-directional uh, benefit? And it is with a purpose that I put two arrows uh, on this, uh, on this uh, picture also. So one of the things is, is uh, they have a very low skilled faculty uh, in their uh, faculty list. So they want to have some kind of training. So in the future, uh, what one of the things that we are proposing is probably we are going to bring a couple of faculties, depending on what their interest is, and train them on a particular thing uh, here in our faculty, within, within our departments. The other thing is when we go there, if we are going with faculties, who will be willing to train their trainees also? Uh, that's another model also that would be helpful for them. Uh, knowing the shortage of faculty that they have. But another very important thing is being involved in uh, a research uh, on a, in a collaborative fashion. Uh, just recently, um, uh, I had a small grant from the African Studies International Collaborators Program here from our institution. And two of uh, the Ethiopian researchers from Jima University were here actually for two weeks visit. And the experience that they had here was really an eye-opener. They have met so many people, and we already have, are developing two research, who, which probably would be funded uh, in the long term, uh, and which will train also a PhD candidate from their side uh, within these uh, programs uh, in the future. So we have to be creative. There is no model. There is no set-aside money that we can help uh, any program, but we have to be very creative on how to help them and sustain those activities. Otherwise, it's going to be a one-time show and it's really going to be fizzle out uh, over time. And every new idea that we see from any other departments that has started this ahead of us, uh, we will incorporate it. economical and they are very willing also to collaborate because you know UW is a, a well-known and international institution and people will want to be uh, associated in some form or another uh, with this kind of institution so if we were to come in with an idea that really promotes their aspirations and hopes also very easily we can uh, create uh, something out of that relationship thank you yeah. Ethiopia or internationally? Uh -huh. I mean, uh, uh, to summarize briefly, if, uh, if I understand the question very is there any interest from the Department of Medicine really to include cultural competencies and other uh, issues within global health into the training? Is no, that wasn't really my question. I yeah. wondered if Ethiopia has recruited some organizations like Alpha, for example, the school of business. 
So basically what uh, you're asking, Anne, is the interdepartmental relationship that we could create and generate uh, within uh, our institution, whether it's with the School of Business or maybe even School of Global Health. And, uh, and that is part of the model of the Global Health. I'm actually uh, in continuous discussion with the Global Health Institution. Uh, I mean, in the future, um, I mean, the Department of Medicine, uh, I will leave that to Dr. Page also, m might bring those big players within our institution uh, to work with us, but in a small fashion. Right now we are w working with the departments, the Department of Pediatrics, Department of Emergency Medicine. It's not going to bring us dollars and cents, but it will give us a, a very broad and uh, deep uh, faculty uh, where we can, our fellows and uh, residents can rely upon for mentorship. Questions. I want to thank Dr. Siraj for an outstanding grand rounds. Please keep coming back next week uh, and each week thereafter. Uh, as I mentioned, we've got a great lineup um, for this academic year. Thank you for being here and thanks again to Dr. Siraj. Thank you.